that um, haven't been to any of our events before, I'll very briefly tell you about us. We're a student society for OU psychology students and alumni, and we're volunteer-run, not-for-profit, registered charity, affiliated with the um, Open University Students Association. We work separately but collaboratively with faculty um, to give you opportunities to enrich your study and your enjoyment of psychology. And our aim really is to offer something for everyone. So we do um, local pub meets and um, revision weekends, day conferences, and just full-on weekends devoted to psychology. But it's not all hard work. There's uh, plenty of opportunity to um, socialise afterwards. And uh, we're open to OU and non-OU, so non-OU people are welcome to attend our events. So it, do look us up on the website, oops.org.uk, and see what's coming up. Well, okay, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Professor Frederick Toys. Fred is Emeritus Professor of Biological Psychology at the Open University, where he has a 40-year association. 42. A 42-year association. Just one year more each presentation. <laughs> <laughs> well, we know Fred best for his teaching, as a much-loved tutor on many OOPS events over the years, and we're delighted that Fred is our president, president of OOPS. Fred has also taught undergraduate students in France, Germany, Denmark, Romania, Moldova, the Netherlands, Sweden, and the USA. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Although we know Fred best for his teaching, the rest of the world knows him better for his extensive research output over many years, covering an eye-watering array of topics from eye movement to sexual desire. Fred's most recent book, How Sexual Desire Works, won the prestigious 2015 American Publish Publishers Book of the Year Award in the category of psychology. One of many highlights of Fred's career is the development of the incentive motivation model and the application of it to sexual motivation and sexual offending. It is this model that Fred will be presenting this afternoon. Fred Thank, Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Can you hear okay if I speak without the microphone? They do say if, if you can't, gesticulate in some way. And I'm delighted to be here. Thank you, London Oops and Abigail and Graham, for organising this. I see folk from all around. I'm impressed. I see folk from Cumbria, from various places, from Western Supermare, from Bangor. I think the record is held by Utrecht in the Netherlands. Can anyone beat Utrecht in the Netherlands? No? Okay, you get the first prize. <laughs> Delighted to be here, as I said, and to present this, and to be um, paired with my good friend Kent Berridge. So to start with, those are the topics that I should be handling in the order I should be handling them. First that. And let's start with Freud, that's probably a good place to start. And this is the only thing I understood about the, the, his paper, The Pleasure Principle. I understood the first paragraph, which is this, but beyond then he completely lost me on what earth he was saying. But uh, this much clearly, so we believe that any given process originates in an unpleasant state of tension. A relaxation of this tension, I, with avoidance of this pain or with the production of pleasure, well, that's the root the basis of Freudian motivation. You're essentially trying to get rid of something that is there, and only by behaving in an appropriate way, sexual, aggressive, or whatever, can you lower this tension level. It do doesn't sound as if Freud had a great deal of fun in his life, but um, <laughs> that's, that's the basic principle of what it's all about. Um, then we have, sorry about this, um, Deborah, we have Freud, uh, uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs here, which uh, must be the most reproduced diagram of all time in psychology. I think it, the, uh, the article had 32,000 citations last time I looked. Uh, the influence is enormous, but in my view it is fundamentally flawed in the sense that right at the bottom he has what he calls physiological needs. Breathing, food, water, sex, sleep, homeostasis, excretion. Well, I indeed want to put sex in the same category as feeding for some purposes, but I don't regard sex as a physiological drive in the sense that nobody ever died through lack of sex. <laughs> Whereas, um, if any of the others are thwarted, death will follow in time. 
Um, so I think that's for what I think Maslow's uh, muddled about is the causal and the functional um, ethological level of explanation. Clearly, all of these are imperative for genetic perpetuation, but I think rather few people actually engage in sexual activity with the intention of genetic perpetuation. Some clearly do, and so I think that's the muddle inherent in it. The second muddle I think is inherent in it is that he puts sex at the bottom when this is a completely optional activity, some people live a complete life as asexuals with no interest in sex whatsoever and seem not to suffer for it, whereas belonging is way up here, and I would put that right at the bottom almost, because it's very rare indeed to vanishing point to find someone who leads a, a good life, happy life, without belonging to somebody. Um, being put in, in isolation in a prison is regarded as an extreme form of torture. So I think Maslow is fundamentally wrong about the, this diagram, but there are some good things about it as well, I have to say. Okay, and now we have drive theory associated with uh, the early days of behaviorism, particularly Clark Hull. Not Skinner. Skinner didn't theorize. Skinner just watched his rats and recorded what he saw. Um, he didn't actually theorize very much at all. But according to Hull, then drive is based upon homeostasis. A deviation from normal is a negative thing, and behavior serves to lower that drive. Correction can be positive, and it will go up, and the negative will come down. So that's essentially the drive theory within behaviorism, which I think, again, is fundamentally flawed. There are some quite striking similarities between some of the behaviorists and Freud. Uh, obviously, some very big differences as well. So problems with drive theory. Take this one. I had a nice home. Money was not short. I had a loving husband. The thrill of getting away with it was the drug, not the actual thing stolen. Um, it, it seems clear that people go looking for exciting things, not to lower a level of activity in any sense, but to increase a level of activity, to increase a level of arousal. And here's another example that illustrates this. Um, my problem is that I get no thrill when I'm with a legal prostitute, so I find myself drifting across to the big city, across the county line, where prostitution is against the law. I realize that this is illegal and probably unsafe, uh, but it seems to me the only way I can get any satisfaction. Again, I think there's two important messages here. One is that people uh, seek an optimal level of arousal. It can be high or low. Marvin Zuckerman in the United States and Hans Eysenck in this country theorized extensively about this. I think the other important thing is that the search for arousal can merge with other motivations, such as the motivation for sex. It generally is sex or, or aggression that seem to be those which uh, pair most easily um, with the search for arousal. Now, back in about 1954, it was, James Olds, um, uh, then at McGill and later at the University of Michigan, where, where Kent is, um, made this incre incredible discovery, said by some to be the most important discovery in the history of brain science, and maybe they're not un it's not an overstatement, that rats will press a lever in a Skinner box in order to deliver an electric shock to their own brains. And they, they press and press and press at it and keep going. It's as if it's a super reward for them to get an electric shock. Now, quite how you interpret it is open to question, I should question later. But uh, the story was, the headline in New Scientist was, uh, pleasure centers in the brain. The idea was that Olds tapped into a pleasure center and the implications of this are monumental, because if that is the case, you, you could get high just by electrical stimulation. But more seriously, since there is an antagonism between pleasure and pain, people suffering in chronic pain or chronic depression might opt to have an electrode implant in their brains, uh, which they choose to press and uh, their own choosing. It, it seems to have potential medical implications that are enormous. Uh, what it also says is very clearly that these rats are not motivated to lower something, they're motivated to increase the level of electrical excitation of their brains. So slowly, I think, the kind of drive reduction idea is going out. 
Um, so-called pleasure, that's what I've just said there, holds in the middle of 1954. Um, further evidence to, to, I think, undermines drive ideas is that animals are very bad at regulating their internal states of nutrients and water um, by infusing directly into the stomach or into the bloodstream the water or energy. You'd imagine on the basis of drive reduction that they would be particularly good at that and it would be particularly easy to train them to do that in a Skinner box. The truth is they find it very difficult and those that succeed at doing it generate um, surrogate cues when they press the lever, they lick it and chew it. Um, it it's if they, they've supplemented what they're doing and so it's a kind of pseudo water that they're generating if they're thirsty. Um, overeating, undereating, uh, according to hedonic properties, novelty of foods, etc., and stress-induced eating, all of these things seem to argue against the kind of homeostatic regulation of nutrient levels. In terms of sexual behaviour, um, you get an energy discharge at orgasm, that Freud would suggest, but people find attractive sexual contact without orgasm, kissing or flirting. Um, I don't know whether Freud ever did anything behind the bicycle sheds in his school, I doubt it from this. But maybe there weren't any bicycle sheds in Freud's school, that I don't know. But either way, I don't think sexual behaviour fits very well to this idea of lowering some kind of energy level. Uh, Watson tried to be, suggested that drive arises from pressure in the seminal vesicles. The problem there is that 50% of the population don't have any seminal, seminal vesicles. Um, so do they not experience some kind of sexual desire, sexual drive? Again, these are all problems with this kind of model. I mean, the enormous variation in sexual outlet, ranging from zero to something that's all engaging in the person's life. Or sexual addiction, for example. And I do believe it exists, despite what people say, and despite people claiming that you, Ivy, Harvey Weinstein um, could not claim that, whether we could or not, I don't know. But to me, it certainly exists. And there you might find that the person's going to extreme lengths to find sexual novelty or spending hours and hours and hours looking at pornographic images, ignoring their partner at home. It doesn't sound like a drive. It sounds to me like something very focused. Uh, fetishes, the, the sexual desire might be particularly aroused in the presence of leather, say, and rapists don't have an exceptionally high sex drive. Sometimes, again, they ignore perfectly consensual sex in the interests of their aberrant pursuits. Aggression. Enormous variation in outlets over time and between cultures. The Vikings brought fear to parts of the world uh, a couple of hundred years or so ago. And now the Scandinavian countries are models of peace and harmony. I don't think their genes have changed that much over the intervening 2,000 two years or whatever it was, um, uh, but the, the, the social context has changed, I would suggest. The idea that aggression is driven uh, from inside would seem to be maladaptive in terms of perpetuating genes. It, it's not good just to go around picking fights with people because your drive has reached a certain level. It is much better only ever to pick a fight with someone when, when you're threatened. Um, but Freud had this idea that um, acting aggressively or even viewing aggression is an effective way to purge angry and aggressive feelings. I think that's fundamentally flawed. Otherwise, there's a build up of tension as a result of the inevitable frustrations of life. It builds up, it accumulates. And there's a lot, an opinion that needs to be resisted within psychiatry and psychology this cathartic theory of aggression. It's illustrated here in this wonderful movie, Analyze This, where the character played by Robert De Niro is complaining about his unhappy life and how he's plagued by anger the whole time. And the shrink, played by Billy Crystal, says, well, what I do when I'm angry about anything, I take a pillow and I punch it. He said, why don't you try it? Points the pillow. So the gangster picks out his gun and shoots several shots into the pillow and uh, the psychiatrist said, oh, do you feel better now? He said, yeah, shrink, or, or doc rather, he didn't say shrink, he said, yeah, doc, um, I feel a lot better having done that. Um, and that is a myth that's perpetuated that uh, you get it out of your system, you let off steam, 
is a drive theory, which I think is wrong, the pressure cooker analogy. But there's no evidence for a venting of anger. That's the claim to fame of Conrad Lorenz, that hydraulic analogy. You build up pressure over time, and it must be released. And it's, the analogy is that when the pressure builds to a certain point, the right stimulus will trigger aggression. Even if there isn't the right stimulus, after a time it becomes unbearable and you release it on some innocent party. That's his famous best-seller book based on that principle. I believe that present-day civilized man suffers from insufficient discharge of his aggressive drive. Now, no one's ever found any evidence that that is indeed the case. Incentive motivation theory, which I see as the alternative to drive theory, it starts with some of the great names of psychology. I guess I go back to Edward Tolman. I go back particularly to Del Bindra and to Robert Bowles. Bowles has a particular place in my heart, not only as a great psychologist and author of the standard textbook in the subject of motivation, but he also repaired my garage door. And so that was a special place in my heart. And our dear friend, Yuck Punkstep, who died a few years back. Wonderful chap. Now, in 1986, I produced this book with Cambridge University Press. And I know it's a cliche, but in my wildest imagination, I couldn't imagine where this book would take me. And I think a lot of it is owing to a chance encounter in, I think, 1984 at Sussex University, where we, we established a friendship then. But this is where I advanced an incentive theory, building on these grades. So according to this, incentives and internal, internal representations of them excite motivation, e.g. drugs, sex, food, etc. And this is a general principle across motivations. So in the case of feeding, food incentives uh, arouse feeding desire. Low nutrient levels sensitize that process to make food particularly something you're drawn towards. Sexual incentives and internal representations of them excite sexual motivation. Sex hormones sensitize brain processes underlying sexual motivation. Violence and aggression. I think that um, the best, uh, the people that have got closest to this are Albert Bandura and Leon Ber Berkowitz. Um, they're slightly different, but the principle is the same. There are aversive experiences and then there's a kind of cognitive process of what to do about it, emotional arousal that's aversive. You might fear it, you might run away, you might turn to drugs, or you might show aggression. That's basically Bandura. <coughs> and Bandura is most famous, of course, for his Bobo doll, um, which shows the principles of imitation underlying aggression. The children smash it with a hammer. They see, they see the model smashing it with a hammer, and then they're more likely to go and smash it with a hammer themselves. Okay. Um, I would suggest the evidence shows that you could become addicted to violence. Here is a former gang member from Syracuse. The sight of the yellow police tape gives me a rush. My heart is beating, my hands sweating, I am not scared, I'm excited. My mind starts running, I want back in the game. That sounds much like any other form of addiction to me. So incentive theory, an uncommon underlying principle for food, sex, drugs, I would also say aggression too. There's a pull of incentives, they form a kind of magnetic pull on the individual. Homeostasis, it works, of course it does. The great uh, Claude Barnard and people like this uh, got it right about homeostasis, but it's normally achieved by modulation of incentive state. At times of nutrient deficiency, food becomes a magnet to you. And then there's a common incentive process in the brain, combined addictions. Um, people are addicted to two things at the same time, drugs and sex, or gambling and sex, simultaneously, and they're mutually reinforcing, I think, because of a common incentive process underlying each of them. And you get a spillover, a transfer of excitation from one thwarted incentive to another. 
Okay, that brings me up to the time that Kent and Terry came on the scene. And they gave a biological foundation to all this, which it didn't have before. Just to hear the, the, a rough outline, there are relatively few dopaminergic neurons in the brain compared to other neurotransmitters, relatively few. But when that relatively few are disrupted, then various things happen, like schizophrenia, Parkinson's disease, and addictions. And these are the three principal um, pathways employing dopamine that we will be interested in. Pathway one, the green one, that underlies motor control, and that is the one that's primarily compromised in Parkinson's disease. Uh, two, the MOVE one, number two, uh, well, I think it's MOVE, but it's something. Number two is the incentive process employing dopamine. And that is a low-level thing that draws you to incentives. It may even draw you unconsciously to incentives. You're not even thinking about it. Even at a subconscious level, you can find yourself moving towards an incentive because of activity in that pathway. And it's much the same comparing rats and humans. Whereas pathway three... That's the sophisticated one that is peculiarly human almost, not quite, but it's mostly most advanced in humans, and that gives refined cognitive control, which can reinforce or oppose pathway two. You can either collaborate with it or oppose it. Um, in Parkinson's disease, um, one of the treatments is to give drugs that promote dopamine transmission, but it's a blunt instrument because dopamine is perfectly generic as a transmitter. So if pathway 2 is relatively intact, and pathway 1 <coughs> is the problem, if you give a dopamine boosting drug, you will tend to excite pathway 2. And indeed, some people taking medication for Parkinson's disease do develop addictions, for example, to gambling. Okay, so novelty, uncertain reward, Food, sex are particularly effective as triggers to dopamine release. Rats with dopamine depletion slow up responding for food and water in a Skinner box. Now that was known for quite a while that rats, rats stop eating in a Skinner box um, if you give them dopamine blocking drugs. And the idea advanced by Roy Wise was that dopamine essentially is the hedonistic neurotransmitter. So if you knock out dopamine, life is no longer hedonistic. The food is no longer hedonistic, so why bother to work for it if it's no longer pleasurable to eat it? And that was a very powerful message running right through biological psychology until these revolutionaries at the University of Michigan came along and upset the apple cart with their ideas. Um, and this whole held sway in biological psychology. But what um, the Michigan researchers did was to exploit a process whereby we know that if you put um, drops of substance on a rat's tongue, or on a child's tongue for that matter, then you get a kind of hedonic index of whether they like it or not. If they like it, something like saccharine, then they lap it up and seem to try to maximise the intake of it. Um, Whereas if it's bitter, they reject it, they wipe their pores, and it seems that it's disgusting to them. Well, one would logically predict that if dopamine underlies hedonism, that if you deplete a rat's dopamine levels, that they will stop liking, liking the food. They would react. But how do you test how they react? So they devised a technique for putting a small drop of food on a rat's tongue and seeing what it did. And what it did was, if anything, um, it did, well, it did nothing at all. It, it, it actually not depleted the... Um, sorry, I got that wrong. It, it, it did nothing at all. Uh, it tasted much the same. So I've had a number of sleepless nights. Do correct me, won't you? Um, it, it didn't change anything. The rats treated as if, as if it were just as hedonistic after dopamine depletion as before dopamine depletion. So essentially, what the Michigan team argued was that it's not the hedonistic neurotransmitter. If it's not that, then what is it? It is, according to this team of researchers, 
the wanting transmitter. It makes you want things. You crave them, you want them, you work for them. The fact that rats um, in a Skinner box don't work for food is not that the food tastes bad when they're de dopamine depletion, depleted. It's not that the food tastes bad, it tastes the same as ever. They just can't be bothered to press the lever for it. They're lacking the, they're lacking the energy to get going. They don't want it. But if they get it, they'll eat it. Does it make sense? This is such a fundamental change in the way we thought about motivation. And when Berridge and Robinson pr produced their classic paper, which has gone on to become one of the most highly cited papers of all time in neuroscience, this was 1993, I was delighted to see that my common process of wanting and liking was split apart here between wanting and liking as two distinct processes. The wanting was dopamine dependent, the liking was not dopamine dependent. There you are, you have the split there, wanting and liking. Wanting uses a common currency of dopamine, no matter what you want, it underlies want wanting. Whereas uh, opioids and possibly other things, can cannabinoids I guess, um, underlie liking. That's an, essentially a summary. So the phrase wanting versus liking has gone into the vocabulary of psychology now. Um, so they are actually responsible for two new terms, wanting versus liking and incentive salience. What they say is that dopamine attributes incentive salience to things. It makes them salient, wanted, desired, a magnet. But they are linked in, the, in an indirect way. So there's a feedback effect. So generally speaking, what you like, you want. What you want, you like. And there is an interaction between dopamine, do, dopamine and opioid neurons there. So here you have it. Incentive sensitization occurs with exposure to addictive drugs. You want them more and more. And the basis of incentive sensitization is the attribution of salience to cues, the sight of the syringe, the lever in a Skinner box. Those things that lead you to the drug assume e e enormous salience in the brain of the human or rat. Now, here's an interesting picture that's very, very relevant to this. Uh, this eccentric looking gentleman sitting there, um, not, not more than about a mile from here, I would say, at University College London. He's normally found near the entrance to University College London, sitting around. Um, there he's sitting in a meeting uh, at University College. He doesn't contribute a great deal to the meetings, which probably has something to do with the fact that at that time he'd been dead for 130 years, mm -hmm. and that's just his body sitting there. Uh, but uh, Jeremy, the, the English have a reputation for eccentricity, and any non-English folk here will appreciate that that's a good example of English eccentricity at its best. <laughs> and we allow Jeremy Bentham to sit in. It gives inspiration, I think, to the meeting. Um, but it doesn't say a great deal. Mm -hmm. What Bentham's most famous quote is, and this has been repeated tens, hundreds of thousands of times in philosophy courses, psychology courses, nature has placed mankind under the governance of two sovereign masters, pain and pleasure. It is for them alone to point out what we ought to do as well as to determine what we shall do. There are key words. That was okay up till Berridge and Robinson. But post Berridge and Robinson, I think he's been dethroned from his seat at the, at the pinnacle of, of philosophy, because I think now we would say, one sovereign master wanting, it's for it alone to point out. And it may be that pleasure and pain exert have a powerful influence, of course we all know they do, but they do so via the medium of wanting. You want the food, you want the drugs, you want to stop your pain. You want. And I think that's the basic common currency. What the team developed was the idea of wanting in two levels. You have a high level and a low level wanting. The low level wanting is mediated by this pathway too. It's a basic, primitive can be driven in my unconscious forces. Then you have a sophisticated, fully conscious wanting, um, 
which may be in conflict with the lower level wanting. You might want cigarettes desperately, but you might want to not want cigarettes desperately. So if you don't get the cigarettes, it's because your high level system is inhibiting your lower level system. Sometimes you might want at both levels in which they, they reinforce each other. Drugs. Skinner on Freud. Reinforcement one against the rule governed the rational conscious mind. Id versus super ego. Skinner noticed whenever for Freud was photographed, he was always smoking. And I guess when he wasn't smoking, he was tripping on cocaine. Um, <laughs> Skinner saw that as a victory for the reinforcement mechanism, I guess in Freudian terms, an id, um, uh, which there was insufficient opposition from, in Freudian terms, a superego. I think Skinner's absolutely right about that. Um, interesting case there. But if nicotine takes control, then it, what it does is it grabs control of this low-level dopamine pathway. There are various candidates for control there, you see, and nicotine, if not else them, it can, in some cases, lower their candidacy for the control of behaviour. Other drugs, sex, whatever your, your vice is, can seize control of that pathway and tend to undermine the other potential controls. Now, these are popular impressions of addiction. Intense pleasure hedonism, that's why there's such an intensity of pursuit of the drug, because of the sheer intensity, unparalleled intensity, of an opiate high or a cocaine high. Painful withdrawal triggers trigger craving and relapse. I mean, this is sort of the Daily Mail level of understanding, so I'll go and refine this a bit in a moment. And addicts are damaged people. They've suffered early trauma, neglect, early stress. Now, all of those things can be true, but they're not necessarily true, any of them, because if you look at this, the hedonism can be small and decline over time. Nicotine is not that powerfully hedonistic, even the first cigarette. In fact, it might even be aversive. It was when I tried one once. It's awful. Um, painful withdrawal triggers craving and relapse. Withdrawal is not a necessary condition. Craving can be triggered by cues predictive of drug taking, even in individuals that have been clean for years. And not always damaged people become addicts. They are usually damaged in some way. They are usually people living at the margins of society in Canada, Australia. They are people who have been driven off their homelands in, in settlements and so on. Um, particularly prone to alcohol addiction. But it's not because um, the Dutch ethologist Nico Tinbergen, I tried to get it right, don't succeed entirely, I know, but that's the best I can offer pronunciation. Nico Tinbergen spoke of supernormal stimuli. Uh, some things that have never been encountered in evolution. And the kind of things to which we become addicted are super normal stimuli. Pornography. It wasn't around in our early environment. An endless supply of prostitutes standing in the street. One assumes that was not around. Prostitutes dressed in, in particular garments to arouse your sexual excitation. Fast food. Um, drugs. Drugs that target the central nervous system within a few seconds of taking them. We assume none of these things were around in our early evolution. They are supernormal stimuli, and they can capture behavior, even if you're not a person with all these backgrounds. Anyone recognize him? <laughs> yeah. Who is it? Keith Richard. It's Keith Richard, yes. Um, I suppose if you lead a lifetime of hedonism, it may, may show. Um, but he said something very interesting about nicotine. Lou Reed claimed that nicotine was harder to quit than heroin. It is. Describing the temptation to smoke, he added, quitting heroin is like hell, but it's a short hell. Cigarettes are just always there, and you've always done it. I just pick them up and light them up without thinking about it. That's a gem. If anyone wants to set their students an essay, Lynn, do you want to set your students an essay? You could quote that and ask them to comment on it. You'd have the PowerPoints after if you want, you don't need to copy it. Uh, what it says is several things. It says that the most addictive drug is nicotine rather than heroin, even though nicotine is not that hedonistic, hedonic. 
I just pick them up and light them without thinking about it, indicating the unconscious pull of the sight of cigarettes or advertising. And what is also interesting is I suspect, in a sense, he's not comparing like with like because nicotine is everywhere. Cocaine is, even for him, he's got to seek it out. Uh, so I think why nicotine is so addictive is because of the predictive cues around. Um, I, I believe that rats are more reluctant to press for nicotine than for cocaine. You have experts here, they will correct me if I'm wrong. But So I don't think it's intrinsic to the chemical properties of nicotine, I think it's the social context that makes it so difficult to resist. Okay, wanting incentive sale is distinct from liking. Wanting can get dis dissociated from <coughs> liking, and you can extrapolate, I believe, to non-chemical addictions. Uh, so stay in stable relationships, wanting can go down drastically, in, but liking can remain roughly the same. So the person doesn't actually crave their partner. I have to be a bit careful what I say my wife on the front row. <laughs> but people can crave. Uh, well, well no, they don't crave. They crave the next door neighbour, maybe. But they still like their partner's sex almost as much as before. They just don't crave it to the same degree. And addiction, sexual addiction, they want inordinately, but don't necessarily like to the same extent. Norman Deutsch, a Canadian psychiatrist, said, paradoxically, the male patients I worked with often craved pornography, but didn't like it. This is textbook, Berridge and Robinson. Comment of a wife, this, this, I think it was Paula Hall, I think, was a psychologist. The wife went along because the husband was addicted to the use of sex workers and pornography. And she told the clinical psychologist, he tells me, that you could want something inordinately, but not like it very much. Is that true? And so the same kind of, yeah, we see those, these chaps at the University of Michigan, they've shown this exactly can happen. She said, well, I can forgive him then. As long as he doesn't like it, I don't mind him wanting it. <laughs> well, there you are, you said, you've saved a marriage. Okay. How about that? <laughs> wanting versus liking romance. Now, this was done in 1027, this was written. If you like to look at the characteristics of romance, mental preoccupation, derangement of the reason, melancholia, transformation of settled temperaments, alteration of natural dispositions, moodiness, sighing, at the, all the other symptoms of profound agitation. It's not much of an advertisement for romance, is it? If that were a job advertisement, I doubt we're going to get a single applicant. But people nonetheless fall into romantic relationships. I mean, apart from one which is ambiguous, all the rest are decidedly negative. So why do people fall in love? Uh, Darwin remarked about this, why did he fall in love? You know, he, all his rational mind said it would be a disaster, this marriage, but he said he simply couldn't resist falling in love. I suspect the incentive salience has something to do with it. Um, properties of romantic love, uh, rapid effect, high level control, little match for low level pull, I know it's crazy what I'm doing, I know he's married, I know he'll never live his wife, as much as I try, but I still want him, I can't resist him. And then when it goes wrong, you get an instantaneous switch to despair or anger. It doesn't go through zero, so this is a message I pick up on later, it doesn't go down through zero and out the other side, it instantly switches to something negative, which I think says something about domestic violence, and why people go back to violent partners. Obviously there are other factors like economics involved. I think this is one such factor. Romance addiction. Addiction would be defined as the stage where desire becomes a compulsive need, when suffering replaces pleasure, when one persists in the relationship despite knowledge of adverse consequences including humiliation and shame. It doesn't speak of universal hedonism, does it? Sometimes little or no wanting in the case of depression, but still liking. A person can't be bothered to get out of bed in the morning. They're reluctant to get out of bed. They don't have the energy, the want to get out of bed. But if, for example, you could use a shape behavior shaping technique um, to get them out of bed, they might quite enjoy the cinema if you get them there. Again, I think this is uh, the, the, the difference between wanting and liking. Um, dopamine, now a general purpose neurotransmitter underlying incentive approach 
energizing behavior underlying any form of incentive approach. Here's an interesting study based on all this. Uh, Catherine Demos. Um, she scanned undergraduates arriving at university and looked at the activity in their dopaminergic systems and made a note of it. And then six months later, she... Hello. Hi, Fred. You made it. We did. Hi. Excuse us, everybody. Don't worry, don't worry. Where can we sit on the edge? I know you've had flooding. Yes. <laughs> These folk have come from Exeter, and apparently there's flooding on the line. Uh, okay. She then followed them up over six months. And better than chance, she could predict um, their obesity based on their reaction to this, or their number of sexual encounters based on their reaction to this. So there, this was this common neural pathway, but, but captured, caught, or whatever, triggered by whatever your particular vice happens to be. So there you have candidates for control. Um, and now it's been brought to bear on social incentives as relevance to autism, that maybe social incentives behave somewhat like the same way. Unfortunately, what oxytocin does changes by the week. So the very latest, and I'm not sure what it does, the last time I looked, it favoured the in-group as opposed to the out-group, but that would fit with falling in love. Um, it acts synergistically with dopamine, according to some models. Um, Chevalier has produced a, a review article on this. Now, let's go back to this phenomenon of electrical stimulation of the brain. Objections to drive theory. Well, the objection to drive theory, as I said before, is they seem to be exciting themselves rather than lowering any kind of drive. They're injecting something into their brains that makes them keep going. People said it's an intense pleasure, like the most delicious food you could possibly eat. But then it doesn't behave like this, because they often need a kick start to get them going in the morning. Whereas if the food were that intense, they wouldn't. They'd go out and start pressing the lever. When you put them in extinction, they quit relatively quickly. So it doesn't seem to be intense hedonism. If it's not intense hedonism, then what is it? And we've known for some years that the sites of electrical stimulation are also the sites where if the experimenter stimulates through the very same electrode, they'll start eating. But again, it's a strange sort of fickle eating. They'll go for one particular food and reject other foods. Um, so are you actually, it, it seems odd that an animal would voluntarily opt to make itself hungry. That doesn't seem to make sense. So what on earth is happening? And in the taste reactivity test, Ballenstein and Kent showed that there's no increase in hedonics if you accompany it by stimulating electrodes in this region. So tentatively, and Kent is too modest to claim this, tentatively it suggests that Olds was not uh, tapping into pleasure centres, he was tapping into incentive centres, wanting centres. They wanted they discovered this shock, they wanted it, pressed the lever, then they wanted it another again, and they kept on and on and on and on. And this featured in science fiction, even drunks at parties will come and ask you about this experiment and say they discovered pleasure centres in the brain, I think not long ago. Uh, but it appears that they were not actually, whether there is a pleasure centre, I'm going to leave to Kent's, there, there's clearly a pleasure neural process, but whether you can tap into a pleasure centre, that I'm not sure. Feeding, a recent review, another two recent reviews, looked at the various theories to obtain, uh, to understand obesity, and found that the incentive sensitization theory did better than any of them in predicting obesity. Uh, the sight of tempting food arouses activity in this dopaminergic system amongst people who become obese. Aggression particular time of anger, the opportunity to perform aggression can take on repetitive qualities associated with pleasure. Activation of this pathway, this dopaminergic pathway, an approach motivation is based on dopamine, okay, and is reinforced based on its consequences. Psychopathy. This is a study that looks at psychopaths, and this study shows that they are particularly sensitive to reward. There you see 
the, the, the scale on the psychopathy scale um, and the sensitivity rewards in the scale of the voters. Now here's a very interesting case. This chap it was described as the most perverted individual the FBI had ever investigated. Um, it would be easier to describe the sexual perversions that he didn't have rather than the ones that he did have. Serial killer from Wichita, Kansas, um, who took 31 years to catch. Caught because he naively trusted the police. Ah, the, he rang up the Kansas police one day and said, is it true what I hear that you can't trace the origin of a floppy disk? And they said, quick thinking officers said, and that's absolutely right, no idea where a floppy disk has come from. He said, right, well, I'm going to send you one with all my plans for killing. <laughs> so he sent it in, and, and there was Ebenezer Baptist Church, which he to Kansas. So I think they got to the church quicker than he did, and arrested him after 31 years of terrorizing this community. Now what's in particularly interesting about him is, there he is, he looks like everyone's famous favourite accountant, doesn't he, or school teacher or something. These people don't have serial killer written across their foreheads, of course. Um, now, Catherine Ramsland has written a biography of him, and she he describes increased incentive salience in this case, triggered by the prospect of killing. Dopamine acts during novelty and excitement. Well, I mean, you can't really think of anything more novel or exciting if you're into it than serial killing. Sex link serial killing, this is. But then what, after he studied the subject himself, um, what um, Dennis Rader said, I wonder if I fall under the hyperreactive dopamine thesis, could my stride and be bigger? Interesting, it might well be. Um, I don't know, it might well be. I, I imagine it's definitely more reactive to the cues to sex link serial killing. Gambling, the role of uncertainty and immediacy of reward. Um, there's the there's a Skinner box, I'm sure you're all familiar with that. The rat presses leave to get a pellet of food. Uh, when the reward is uncertain, when, sorry, when the reward is certain, 100% um, good prediction in the lever, every lever press delivers a pellet of food, the best possible prediction, but it doesn't give the maximum rate of acquisition of the habit. It's a much stronger habit if they only get a pellet every 50% of the times, so every second lever press they get a pellet then it's a much stronger habit they acquire, which makes sense. Uh, normally things in the wild um, don't yield 100% prediction. Normally the cue is followed sometimes by no reward. Um, and that is, I think, the Las Vegas situation. Why it is so addictive is because of the uncertainty of reward. It strengthens their dopaminergic systems being that system. If they knew they were getting a very, very small reward every time they press the lever. I doubt you get many people queuing up in Las Vegas to go to casinos. Okay, the misbehavior of organisms understood. That was Skinner's classic 1938 book, Emphasis Upon Positive Reinforcement. The Shaping Reward Successive Approximations to Lever Pressing in the Skinner Box. That's classic Skinner. Uh, the behaviour is followed by consequence such that the behaviour increases in frequency. <coughs> the consequence is described as positive reinforcement. But then along came along troublemakers, Breland and Breland, who showed situations where this simply didn't work. They were training animals for zoos and circuses and things, for advertisements, and found that sometimes their shaping worked brilliantly at first, but then it degenerated. And so they'd train a pig to deposit a coin in a piggy bank, for example, and the pig would pick it up and at first deposit it in the piggy bank, but then it degenerated. The pig couldn't let the token go. It kept chewing it, licking it, burying it, throwing it up in the air, various things. And the logic coming from the Berridge, Robinson and Flagel team in Michigan is that undue incentive salience was attributed to the token which I think makes very good sense. And there, there they have a situation for investigating just this in Michigan, this kind of situation. Mm -hmm. So there, I, I, I've, I've said that now, so that's, I, I've said all of that, I think, yes. Um, I think it can have tragic consequences. Um, this chap, the Rotherham Shoe Rapist, had a collection of 126 women, pairs of women still have to have heels. 
He was only arrested through DNA, mercifully, otherwise he'd probably still going on. Um, I would su suspect that in fetishes like this, that the shoes assume inordinate incentive salience. The whole woman probably doesn't. He's probably scared of the whole woman, but not scared of her shoes. Speculation, but I think it could hold some truth there. Spillover effects of one incentive to another. Now, if you never work with rats, you, you've missed out on one of life's unique pleasures. Uh, I investigate this phenomenon as part of my PhD. A mysterious phenomenon at that time. Um, if you put rats in a Skinner box and drop pellets of food into them, one, one small pellet a minute, then over time they accumulate enormous amounts of water if there's a water spout there. They drink dangerously high levels. They, they risk water intoxication. Now, the Dutch ethologist Nico Timbergen suggested that there's a spillover of drive. One drive is frustrated, uh, the food, because it's a tiny, tiny pellet, so all that drive that they got spills over into drinking. Well, since we don't know about the existence of drive even, I don't think it's a good start. He called them displacement activities, and his claim to fame, which he got the Nobel Prize, was looking at herring gulls and things, displacement pecking when they were thwarted. But I think there's a better explanation than that in terms of incentive motivation. What I think is happening is that they get all excited and dopaminergic agitate, agitated by the food. And when there's a derisory small pellet, then that transfers to the lead, to the water bottle. That assumes incentive salience. And it doesn't happen if you block their dopaminergic systems. The marshmallow test. Here, children get captured by one marshmallow. Even if they leave it alone and wait for 10 or 15 minutes, they'll get two marshmallows. Impatience. And the recently theorists have been in terms of incentive motivation arousal and generic uh, motivation system. This creates apparently impatience in heterosexual men looking at this picture. <laughs> I can sort of appreciate it might. Um, but what, what these researchers, von den Berg, trying again to get the pronunciation right, the man from the mountain. There's so many Dutch called that. Where are these mountains in the Netherlands that they come down from? I've never yet seen one. And yet hundreds of Dutch are called von den Berg. Now, at any rate, she creates impatience. I don't just mean her, I mean a sort of attractive woman like that. Um, why, the effect of it is that she excites a, a generic approach motivation. I sort of feel it. Um, and if you are asked if you want an immediate reward of, say, one dollar, or a delayed reward of two dollars, then folk looking at that picture opt for the immediate reward of one dollar. They're impatient. They can't wait for the two dollars in the future, or whatever, or ten dollars next week or something. It, compared to the control, who is not exposed to a neutral picture. And that, even that has the effect on heterosexual males who make them impatient. Sorry, Graham, <laughs> but in neither sex does that create impatience. No, give me time. <laughs> you must find something else to wear. Um, interesting in women, though. Try with women, clean. if they can actually touch it, it creates a little bit of impatience. But not the same extent as men. Women are not driven visually to the same degree. But they, they see that shows it. They have to touch it. Just looking at that. Uh, no, sorry, I got that wrong. Not a tea. That T-shirt has nothing for anybody. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's a pair of boxer shorts that work for women. If you can stroke a pair of boxer shorts, then you become impatient. You want the immediate reward rather than the delayed reward. And this is exploited by advertisers. I mean, that's not. That's quite a typical scene at a motor show. Um, the, the, the women are inaccessible. The car is accessible if you've got the right money. So that tends to get guys out, bring their checkbooks out. I don't know what I'd do in that situation because I don't have a driving license, but I suppose all my arousal would just re reside with them and I don't know what I'd do. You smoked cigarette in St. Petersburg? Yes, I did. I did. You're right, I did. 
I did. You're absolutely right. I smoked a cigarette in St. Petersburg. I haven't done it in years. Yes. Because of this imagery. You were there, but they were standing next to me. Yeah. But, you know, I couldn't, couldn't be rude to them, could I? I had to, you know. <laughs> okay. Aggression. Displaced aggression. Well, this seems to follow a similar principle. Uh, famously, the guy has a row with his boss. He can't hit the boss, but he can kick the cat. Uh, this is it. But, um, you know, the displaced aggression sometimes takes ages, years after the event, and the person is still ruminating about it. So I doubt whether the arousal has been dissipated, uh, but I think they are ruminating, reviving the memory the whole time about the injustice they perceive to have been done to themselves. There's the first case recorded, as far as I know, of displaced aggression. <coughs> Anyone recognize the characters there? Anyone recognize the artist? Blake, yes, it's William Blake. It's displaced aggression. God has upset Cain because he didn't like his gift. He favoured Abel's gift. And so Cain goes off and kills Abel. A good example of displaced aggression. Right, the final theme now, nearly yeah, yeah, I'll do it in five minutes. The formation of some strange incentives. Things can switch to aversion, to appetitive, in the short term, exemplified here going across a frightening bridge, then, then it triggers sexual desire in men if there's a female at the other side, heterosexual men. Famous wrote Bridge Experiment, one of the so-called classics of social psychology. A very strange experiment, but it seems to work. Uh, then you get long-term effects as well. Um, he, he has, yes, he started out uh, as a serial killer from Eugene, Oregon. He was, he was a boy, he, was, he stole a pair of high-heeled shoes and walked around the house and then the mother punished him for it. Um, he was upset that he later developed a fetish for high-heeled shoes. I was sparing the gory details of it, it's a horrendous case. But um, he had this fetish about shoes. Um, there you are, early negative transforms to a positive. I think this happened with Harold Shipman. The death of his mother under morphine was awful for him. He transformed it to an attraction to death under morphine and killed his patients. Here's a particularly bizarre example of this from... Hi. Hello. Vizhny um, Novgorod in Russia. Apologies to three Russian natives in the audience for the pronunciation. Um, Anatoly Moskvin was attending a funeral and in the former Soviet Union and other parts of Eastern Europe, they have open coffins. There was a very young child who was being buried, and some people insisted that he kiss the corpse. And he was shocked, horrified, disgusted. But when sexual maturity kicked in, he felt a desire for corpses of young girls. So he went around the cemeteries, digging up corpses and taking them back to his flat. He put music boxes into and planted music boxes in them, and they were an attraction for him. Very good example of this. Finally, now briefly, because I'm up against the time, to most people, this is a scene, of course, from the Vietnam War, and that every time I see that, I get shivers down the spine. The horror of that war. And you'd think that most people would not be able to hardly wait to get back home to the United States. And I guess most of them were desperate. Well, they were, because even those who were high on heroin most of the time were able to give it up. In, they gave urine samples, and they got clean of, of heroin. In, in, in the reward, they shipped back to the United States. That's one message. The other message is that there was not a big drugs problem taken back to the United States because of the contextual controls over it. Vietnam was one thing. Richmond, Virginia was something quite different. The other interesting message is that some of these people actually wanted to get back to Vietnam, not to serve the country, but for the excitement of the battlefield. So it's stressful at first, then it becomes easier, finally enjoyable. Some use such expressions as sexual trip and orgasmic to describe the battlefield. Some will actually go out looking for people who look like Vietnamese in order to pick a fight with them. That's it. Thank you. And that's you.